Great. All right. So how about we jump in since I feel like we'll have a lot to talk about um, with this topic. Welcome, everyone. I'm Natasha Banam, founder of Expecting Health, and I'm so happy that you are joining us today for our Breaking Silos, Building Systems, Committing to Inclusion to Drive Change. Uh, we have some great panelists, but I'll get to that in a moment. Um, and first, we'll go over some of the logistics for um, today's webinar. Um, today's webinar is um, kind of a podcast style discussion. And so what we mean by that is we will have a little bit of a framing of the topic and our perspectives around inclusion. Then we will invite our um, two panelists to have that discussion amongst the three of us to see kind of different experiences and perspectives around inclusion. Um, and then we will end the session with questions from you all. So um, if you want to ask our panelists a question, you can send them in the chat box um, or at the time when we let you know, you can unmute and ask your question during the Q&A uh, session at the end. I will say, you know, just in case we have a really active and dynamic discussion, we will most likely do the questions in the chat box first. So just putting that out there in case you really, really want your question um, answered, that might be the fastest way. But we really are going to try to be able to cover um, both the chat box questions as well as any questions that come through um, when you unmute towards the end. That'll be in about the last 10 minutes or so of this session. We are recording this and it will be available on our YouTube channel in a few weeks. Um, as well, uh, we will be sure to send out a email message to anyone who has registered for this so you know that it is available. Um, and again, like I said, that'll just be in a few weeks. And with that, um, I am going to give a very, very, very brief overview, um, an introduction to our panelists. But um, once we get into uh, kind of the meat of our discussion, I will invite them to give more perspective on who they are, what brings them to this work. But just to be able to kind of kick off uh, the session, um, we have our two amazing uh, parent and family leader um, panelists. First is Deepa Shira Vasa Varden, um, who is with the SPAN Parent Advocacy Network. Uh, she also works with us with our Family Center, our um, National Family Center work group on inclusion, as well as our community of practice on DEI. We also have joining us today, Tawana Williams, who is a parent leader, and she works very closely with us around our Navigate Newborn Screening um, Ambassador Program. So two real rock stars, two people who I have learned so much from over the past years, and am really delighted to be able to have this conversation with them. Um, and to kick off, uh, we will speak a little bit about this core question. This is the key question to our time today, right? What does inclusion mean to you? Um, and I'm sure everyone has a little bit, if not a lot, to say or to think about that. But I hope at the end of our discussion today, you'll have a little bit more to add to that. Um, for us at Expecting Health, you know, we really think of inclusion in a threefold. One is, you know, that basic, what does it mean? And for us, we really think of inclusion, not just as an act or one thing you do one time, but really a philosophy and really thinking about how we do our work and how we approach it. You know, we really look at all of our work, whether it's setting up a committee, writing an article, or even a session like this, and really think about, you know, who or what are the voices that um, are missing what could we do to be a little bit more inclusive? Is there a perspective that's missing? Um, and also, what can we highlight even more? I think sometimes we can do the first step of trying to see who's at the table, but then we have to go that um, further step of saying, okay, and whose voice is actually being heard? Are there people we need to be pulling into the dialogue or discussion a little bit more? And what does that look like? Um, and how can we do that? Really doing that more direct highlighting of different people experiences and perspectives. Next, kind of that other key question of, so why is this important? 
you know, I tend to think of inclusion isn't just a destination, but it really is that journey, even um, however cliche that may sound. It really is about that experience of really thinking about how can we be more inclusive, what can we be doing, and what can we learn? Um, both what can we learn from each other and also what can we contribute to the discussion. And I think we will have a lot of that happening today in terms of people sharing their different perspectives and experiences and also listening to each other and hearing about um, different, different ideas as well as learning from the questions that will be shared um, throughout this session. And lastly, always an important question is, you know, what is that change that we really want to see um, in the world when we're doing this work? And for us at Expecting Health, you know, that true goal is really belonging. Um, and when people feel and know they belong to a system, obviously in this case the healthcare system, it isn't that you are fitting into this bigger system, but it feels like that bigger system is really built and created for you and for your experience. And that is really our goal, that belonging, that really having a sense of, um, wow, my experiences have really driven what I'm seeing around me, not, oh, I guess my story must be different than others because this doesn't seem quite like a fit. Because we know that that tends to be the story we hear from families more so than, than the other of, this just fit perfectly, I got all my needs met, right? But that's what we're all working towards together. Um, so I give that context just to give a sense and to help kick off the discussion um, about kind of how we at Expecting Health look at inclusion and these different parts of it. Um, but I am going to now invite our panelists to you know, take a few minutes to introduce themselves, you know, tell us your name, a little bit of background, um, you know, what roles you may have with Expecting Health in the work that we do, and you know, what have been your experiences around family engagement and DEI work, um, and, and what does inclusion mean to you? So we will start off with Deepa. Thanks, Natasha. Um, I am Deepa Srinivasavardhan. So just again, um, thank you for the introduction. Um, but I also wanted to add that um, first and foremost, I am a parent of two um, young adult sons, one of whom has autism and he has been, or his journey has been the impetus uh, for the work that I do. Um, everything that I do from um, the early childhood work, the family engagement work, anything around inclusion, um, you know, I would say has been um, a result of my experiences and, um, and, and those experiences shaping my perspectives along the way. So, um, so that, with that being said, I also work at Span Parent Advocacy Network, which is the Parent Center and Family to Family Health Information Center, our Family Voices State Affiliate Organization, Parent to Parent Program and National Federation for Families with Children with Mental Health Needs uh, for the state of New Jersey. Um, being that one stop for families um, is um, has really been helpful for me as well uh, uh, in accessing resources, learning opportunities, and um, giving me the flexibility to, um, to share my voice, to be that parent leader who can um, really um, speak up, take action, and create change. So um, I just uh, am glad to be here and be able to talk a little bit more about um, inclusion and respond to some of the questions that is probably lingering in all of our minds today. Great, thank you so much. And now, uh, Toena. Hi, and like Deepa said, thank you very much, um, Natasha, for that wonderful introduction. Um, my name is Toena Williams. Um, I am also a parent of, a ch um, I actually had three children. Um, one of my children um, who is a, older teenager um, also has um, sickle cell disease, um, which is what kind of brought me into this world. Um, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, a little bit um, about, you know, my work in roles um, with Expecting Health, um, as Natasha pointed out, um, I am I'm working um, with the ambassador program. Um, and I'm also a part of the newborn screening steering committee. 
Um, all of these roles um, kind of was brought to me um, through my work um, in um, the Children's Sickle Cell Foundation of Pittsburgh, um, where we serve as, as the community um, organization for um, people with sickle cell, both child and adult, and really helping to bring um, inclusion and allow them to have a voice. Um, and when they didn't have a voice, be that bridge between um, them and the um, healthcare um, facilities um, to really help them identify who they were. Um, as far as um, what inclusion really um, means to me personally, um, through the work that I've done um, as a community health worker, um, just honestly, even my work in being in management through the banking system, um, helping to hire and, you know, kind of being that background of the human resource really being able to focus on, you know, giving each and every person an opportunity um, to be a part of something great um, and be a part of the change regardless to, you know, their background, their race, their gender, their condition, whatever the case may be. Um, so that's what um, has kind of brought me to expecting health. Um, and that's a lot about what inclusion really means to me, having everyone who could be a piece of the puzzle um, at the table. Great, thank you so much for that. Uh, so now I'm going to dive into some of our questions and um, I will alternate back and forth in terms of who uh, gets to kind of kick off the answers. Don't worry, I will prompt you. You don't have to keep it in your head. Um, but, uh, you know, we've already talked a little bit about, you know, what does inclusion look like? What does that mean to, to all of us on this call? Um, and I'd love for you both to take that a little bit further um, with us starting with Tawena. In terms of thinking, you know, what are maybe some of those specifics that we'd want to look for? You know, what does an inclusive system look like to you? What are those key indicators or what, what happens or what do you see that would really make you think, oh, wow, now that is really inclusive, um, particularly in that healthcare system. Um, I think it's great that you brought in your, your experience from more of that HR perspective. I think they've done um, or had to do more of that specific streamlined work of what do those indicators look like. I think we're still working and building those out in healthcare. Um, but would love to hear, um, Tawena, your perspectives on that in terms of what makes you kind of go, oh, now that's inclusive. That's something that we should be replicating in other places. Um, so fortunately, um, I've kind of been blessed to say the less um, that I've been in an area um, in a part of a healthcare system that is really focused on including everyone, um, whether it's the patient, whether it's, you know, the family members, whether it's the community, um, whether it's the providers themselves, you know, whether it's, you know, state reps, whatever it is, um, just really bringing um, everybody to the table to help push, you know, for change. Because what we realize is, is that, you know, sometimes, yeah, you, it starts at home, you know what I mean? You have to, um, really be focused and really be intentional on what you do in your own space and family um, to bring on the change. However, um, to really um, be the difference and be the change makers, you have to step outside of your comfort zone a lot of times. Um, so for me, you know, I had the opportunity, um, like I said, with the foundation um, to actually partner with the hospital. Um, you know, get in touch, not only from a parent standpoint, um, you know, and reach out to our doctors and be able to have those conversations, um, but also um, from a professional standpoint. Um, and for me, that gave me a different type of voice that a lot of times I don't think we really think about. Um, you know, it's one thing to explain your story in a way that your family and your friends um, can understand it. It's a whole nother thing to explain your story in a way that medical professionals and people of that sort can understand it. And sometimes that's where the bridge is. So being able to really include all those pieces um, on each level um, 
that's really what has been um, instrumental to me. Um, kind of as you brought up in my human resource background, um, which was actually, like I said, through a bank. So it had nothing to do with, um, you know, medical or, you know, health or anything like that. Um, but it was extremely instrumental um, because it helped me to be able to not only view my own possibly unspoken biases and be able to check them at the door, but also to be able to understand how people may have those and how to start breaking those down and how to be, you know, that voice or that chance of change and what it takes to do it. Great. Thank you so much. I love that, you know, taking that experience and, you know, sometimes we learn skills in a completely different realm and it's a little bit easier to absorb that. And then we can apply it to things that are a little bit more personal to us, right? That are affecting our families Absolutely. Um, and, and the families we work with. So that's great. Um, Deepa, same question. Yeah, um, as I heard Twaina speak, um, you know, I, uh, you know, saw a lot of similarity in the way we think and do our work. And, um, you know, especially with building those family, professional partnerships and relationships. Um, I support a lot of family engagement activities. I, um, you know, help support parent leadership development. But, um, but then again, uh, it's also very important to not just let the professionals see the value of including parent leaders and their voices, but also letting parent leaders know how it is important for them to be partnering with those professionals. Um, so, um, you know, there, there may be some biases for the parent leaders as well, or the parents or the, and the families as well that are interacting with these professionals and may think that they are being excluded or they're not being um, reciprocative in the way that they want the professionals to be. Um, but again, um, supporting their um, understanding and making sure that they have the tools that are necessary to become those partners at, uh, with those professionals has also been really helpful. Um, and, and I think that's, that's probably um, the way that I can say um, inclusion can be possible. Um, you know, that, that it's a two-way relationship between families and professionals and um, or basically people who are providing um, the services and those who are on the receptive end. Um, also making sure that, um, you know, um, that parent leaders or whoever the individuals are that are receiving the service are being part of um, part of the continuous quality improvement process. They are able to um, provide feedback and their feedback are valued. All those things make me feel that that's inclusion and, um, and, and understand that that system is inclusive or that organization is being inclusive. Great, thank you so much. And I, I, I really appreciate you highlighting um, you know, sharing those stories of success back with families too, because I do think that you can kind of get in a place where you feel like um, you're telling your story to so many different people, whether in that clinical setting or in something broader, and you don't always see the immediate change that you would you would think your story um, would provoke, seeing that your story was life changing for you. Um, but I, I think that's a really important piece to be able to highlight where those successes came from and how it can sometimes take a long time and it can feel like no one's listening or no one's really absorbing it, but people are. Um, and, and you never know uh, the number of times someone has said, oh, you know, on one of your webinars three years ago, someone said this and I'd love to connect with them to be able to do XYZ project. Now we don't want it to take three years, but you never know when that opportunity might come up at, the, um, at a different time. So, um, so I think that's great. Uh, so with this question, we'll start with uh, Deepa. Uh, can you highlight or share about a time where either that you remember where either you were um, not being included or it didn't feel like you were being included and, and what that felt like? What were there possible blind spots 
or a time when you really were included and um, that there were very specific actions and intentions that stood out to you to be included. So either or. How about I share both? Um, <laughs> I, um, I just want to share um, a, a small uh, piece of, uh, you know, my experience um, related to my, you know, my son receiving his diagnosis of autism. Um, you know, when I was an immigrant mother, first time mom, um, had no ideas about um, child development, had no um, idea about child development or um, what to look for, um, but just happened to follow along whatever um, came our way, um, you know, talk to the doctor about his development and him not interacting with other children. But the doctor said, you know, because he's a late talker, you know, his interactions might be limited, nothing to worry because he's a boy, things will get better. But then eventually um, we put him in a preschool where uh, he was not able to sustain the demands of the setting, which led to us taking him to a neurologist for an evaluation. And then eventually he received the diagnosis and, um, you know, all I, I, I can still remember those words that I just heard um, uh, after the neurologist had like probably a few minutes to examine my son. And then he said, your son has the autism. Um, and, you know, even that was hard for me to understand because I didn't know what autism was at that point. But then he didn't stop there. He proceeded to say that he would not be um, able to sustain in a uh, public school setting. He would have to go to a separate school for children with autism. Um, and, you know, totally felt being excluded at that point because he was kind of giving me a decision, or I should say, about my son, where he did not. Um, take into account the abilities of my son, nor did he um, ask what our understanding of autism was or, you know, didn't even proceed to um, make us feel included, but just gave the final verdict kind of thing for my son. And, you know, that I felt that was, that was really a difficult situation to handle. Um, being, feeling of being excluded. I'm, I'm able to articulate all that now and talk about inclusion so much, but, um, you know, so many years ago, maybe, um, uh, you know, 20 years ago, I was not that um, ready to think about being excluded or what it would take to be included. Um, but then I'm so thankful that I can quote it as an example of inclusion today because I was able to, um, Follow, follow up, not give up, um, and be resilient to find resources. Um, and, and I'm also thankful that, you know, my, my son was um, also cooperating and being the, being the same way as we wanted to be as a family, um, you know, not giving up and being determined. Um, so he is, um, he wasn't, he, he was included in a public school. He um, went to college. He is now completing his master's. He's driving. He's doing everything that we thought would not be possible for him after what the neurologist had told us. So, um, so again, not, not giving up being patient and persistent and really doing like a, a plan, do, study, act cycle with every situation and with every um, problem we faced with has really been um, very helpful for us. And in terms of inclusion, another um, po more positive example that I wanted to share was uh, the time when I started working for my organization. Uh, I attended one of our first meetings and I said, I'm just a parent and um, shared some of my experiences. And immediately I was told that I'm not just a parent, but I have, I am a parent. And, um, and that mindset uh, of others trying to make me feel included, you know, was such an empowerment and encouragement for me. And um, because uh, of being 
because of having that sense of belonging, it has led me to now talk about inclusion, learn about inclusion and ways to be, um, you know, more inclusive, not just in, you know, for my own family, for my own son, but, um, but in terms of the systems and the organizations that I work for. So um, again, I would be remiss if I uh, don't mention about the family centers um, work around inclusion. Um, you know, I'm really fortunate to be working with um, the family center. Uh, we, I mean, as we move along, I'll share more information about our work group on inclusion and community of practice around DEI. But, um, you know, again, I feel that those are some of the ways that I'm able to um, engage in talking about inclusion and making sure that um, uh, inclusion is in the front and center of the work that the, uh, that the family center does. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, and I appreciate you know uh, both both perspectives, both experiences, and and kind of that um, that you know that keyword of resilience. It, it really is so important. Um, Tawena, can you talk a bit about uh, a time again, either being excluded or where you really noticed you were included? Um, sure. Um, so kind of like Deepa, but a little bit of a different twist. Um, you know, I've been fortunate um, to really um, be a part of a system um, where we were always included by our primary system. Um, and when I say that, I mean, you know, my son's doctors, you know what I mean? My son's um, school, my son's, like anyone who had direct, I guess you could say contact um, with our family, um, they always did a really good job in making us feel included um, from, you know, being a part of the foundation um, as a family um, to becoming a part as an employee to be able to work with all the different families to continue to, you know, try to inspire hope and, you know, um, a voice and, you know, all those things, um, you know, what Deepa said really resonated with me um, because, we always kind of thrived on that, which is you're not just a parent, you know what I mean? Um, you're not just a patient. Um, your story is your own and it's for you to tell and for you to utilize to make a difference with and to really be the voice. Um, and, you know, for me, you know, I've always kind of, you know, been, um, one of the things that my son said, because we participate in our local universities, um, I guess you could say it's like their medical session um, when they um, bring their students in their first year and they talk to them about sickle cell, they actually bring us in to share our personal stories to just really help to create awareness and to make a difference. And um, to Deepa's point, my son kind of def def defeated a lot of the odds as well when you hear about sickle cell, um, you know, through working with it. And I mean, these things are real. It's not that they don't apply. It's just that they don't apply to everyone. Um, and I think that that's huge. And one thing that my son always tends to bring up when they ask him, like, well, what do you like about, you know, your doctors or what do you like, you know, because he always says that, you know, they've made such a huge impact in his life. And his response is always because they see me for me. They don't see him as just another sickle cell patient. They know his background. They know the things that he likes to do. They know, you know, the, you know, charismatic person that he is. They know and ask about his dreams and his goals. Um, and for me, I was never told um, when my son was diagnosed all the things that he couldn't do and all the limitations. And while for some people, um, you know, and looking back now, would I have wanted to know those things? No, I really wouldn't have because there's a lot of things that my son does now that it doesn't put him in the same box as everyone else. However, to say when we felt excluded is when we'll go to like the emergency room 
and there's the people that don't know him on a personal basis. Um, and they just know sickle cell from, you know, Googling something on the internet or from that, you know, that one class that they had in school because it's not taught, you know, in a vast amount. And obviously as a ER attendant, you have a various amount of, you know, things that you're being taught and learned. Um, so for us to walk in that door and, you know, get those um, stereotypes, I'll say, for lack of a better um, word, you know, of either, you know, sickle cell patients are drug seekers or, you know, sickle cell patients can't do this or, you know, won't do that. They have physical limitations and things like that. And because sickle cell is a disease that, you um, you can't see, you know, it's blood. You can't see what's going on. You can't see the physical pain. Um, there's a lot of times where, you know, we are just like, okay, you can kind of tell that they don't take you serious. Um, or, you know, they instantly come in and it's like, oh, okay, well, let's give, you know, him dilated and let's give him, well, for my son, we don't take opioids that much. You know what I mean? But from a lot of things that you hear, whether it's in the media, or whether you read or whatever, that's what they say, which again, you can't. And the benefit that I've had is that I don't judge them because that's the mistake that they made. In, I guess, you know, learning from the information that they were taught. However, it's about once I tell you the difference and once I share our story, allow that to make an impact to not only the treatment that you give to my child, but to any other child, adult, or anyone else out there. Because whether it's sickle cell or anything else, um, it's an individual thing. So you really have to get to know the person and include that person and that family because they know best and they're the experts, even if they didn't go to school for that. And that's really been, you know, two big ways that while there's, you know, exclusion and we still have, you know, amounts to go in the healthcare system because there's definitely still things that we need to do and we need to push forward. There's also still a lot of beauty um, and a lot of lessons that are being learned and given every day that's making a difference to a lot of people and patients in this world. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, and and I, a word that has come up a lot last year and I think will continue to come up a lot for expecting health is the word grace. And I think that's really what you described there in terms of understanding, you know, if someone's not taught something then they may not know it. So there's grace in that and giving grace for that, but also then setting the expectation and saying, and now I've told you, and now we know. So where are we gonna go from here? And I think that's uh, you know such a powerful combination. And um, our next question, um, uh, Tawina, you can kick this off for us is, you know, we've seen that conversations and efforts around diversity, equity, and inclusion have really picked up over the past year or two, um, and that's great. Um, you know, there's some people who have been doing this work for, you know, decades, and there are some people who are still new to it, and there's, a, you know, that new energy in this space. Um, you know, do you see these opportunities for inclusion growing with that, with more of this attention? Um, and, and I think we're uh, I don't want to say far enough out, but, you know, there's been some time from the kind of the big infusion of it seemed like a lot of people were like, oh, my gosh, this is a thing. Um, and, and some things being implemented and, you know, now some time has passed. You know, do you still see opportunity opportunities for um, growth in this space? And, and you know, how, how have you seen these opportunities change over time? Um, you both have worked around inclusion, family engagement, all of that um, for, for, for more than the one to two years that it's been on, on uh, the national radar. So um, Tawina, if you could kind of kick us off around this question. Yeah, so that, that, that one's a loaded one, <laughs> um, at least for me, um, you know, it, it definitely has picked up, um, but it's picked up in different ways. 
Um, you know, the momentum has definitely picked up to whereas, you know, there is a lot more focus on inclusion and a lot more focus of, on righting the wrongs, I guess you can say, um, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, however, I still feel whereas there's a lot of work that needs to be done in really the history and the background and really helping people to understand um, that where we were and where we are is not where we're going. Um, and in order to get where we're going, it's going to take everyone. Um, and, you know, sometimes for me, you know, I live in a predominantly, um, you know, Caucasian community um, where, you know, I'm like less than 10%. Um, so I kind of see it all. Um, and while sometimes I feel like there's a force to push for inclusion that people aren't ready for. And for me, I kind of feel like sometimes that can be more detrimental than it can be good. Um, just because the steps, you know, we all know about that process, you know what I mean? And sometimes there's, you know, some, some ups and downs during the process. Sometimes when that process doesn't have a chance, in my opinion, to really go through with the process and we jump from start to finish, <laughs> um, there's a lot of things that are missed. Um, so, you know, I, I do think, you know, that there has been, you know, definitely a lot of talks and a lot of movement. Um, and I do think that a lot of those things are with good intentions. Um, however, I do just believe that, you know, again, we still just have a, a lot of ways to go. Um, and it takes, you know, all of us to get there. And the openness for people to be like, hey, you know what? I really just don't know. And I really just don't even know where to begin. And I really just don't understand. And to your point, you know, in the last comment that I made, you know, sometimes we have to also be open to that people just don't understand. You know what I mean? Um, they're, they only know what they know. You know what I mean? They only know what they've been taught. Um, and to your point, you know, it's more about, for me, you know, the accountability part, once you find out and what you do with that to drive the change, then it is really focusing on, you know, what you didn't do when you didn't know. Great, thank you for that. Um, Deepa, your, your perspectives on this. Yeah, I really um, like the word accountability that Twaina just mentioned. Um, and I think with accountability comes responsibility. Um, there's a lot of momentum and I hear a lot of positive things and outcomes that, um, that are happening. Um, you know, with, with, a lot of, with many organizations and programs you know, coming up with these office on DAI and, you know, opening up, um, you know, having leadership positions um, in their uh, DEI office that focus on these issues. Um, however, you know, I, I just think that there needs to be more intentional focus. Um, and, you know, and because I'm afraid that it, it's all leading to a general assumption that, you know, either that office of DEI or, you know, the people who are in that office are responsible for, for making the changes or, you know, um, or working on those priorities, but, um, but there is not that alignment and focus, you know, across departments and organizations um, and, and basically making it everybody's business, you know, DEI has to be everybody's business from, you know, practicing it on an individual basis to making sure that, um, you know, it, it is in the front and center of the organization's goals and priorities. I think it, it needs to be everyone's business. And, and, and you know, I see there, is up, there are opportunities for growth. And, you know, just as Twaina mentioned, you know, people don't know what they don't know. 
And they also may not have the um, skills and resources that they need to, to practice that. So, um, so, you know, again, intentional focus and making sure that, um, you know, it's, it's um, in everyone's mind and, you know, there are opportunities over time for people to learn and practice those skills, I think are really important. Great, thank you, thank you. And this is just a reminder that if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we are getting close to the end of our questions. We still have a few more, um, but feel free to submit them that way. Um, and so this question will be, we'll have Deepa kick it off. Um, you know, it, it may seem like diversity and inclusion go hand in hand, um, but how can we create space for diversity and, you know, thinking about that in terms of people with different backgrounds, um, abilities, experiences, perspectives in inclusion, you know, and so kind of a different way of looking at that as, you know, how can we as um, a system of stakeholders really foster that environment that is supportive of um, diverse inclusion and rather than just ch checking off the boxes. And, you know, I, I think we've all been in that case where, you know, you work with a group of people and you really vibe and it's great and it's like, oh, we're so productive and all of that. And then, but then there's always that voice in the back of your head that's like, uh huh, and, and what about that other person? <laughs> or, and what about these other perspectives, which may be a little, doesn't feel quite like the same vibe but you know there's something really valuable there and something that you know is missing um you know just how how do we have that both you know not to assume diversity equals inclusion and inclusion equals diversity but that um that we're paying attention to all of that i don't know deepa if you want to uh, kick us off on that question sure um again i am so fortunate to be working with um, colleagues and peers who are, um, you know, like-minded, who are, um, uh, who understand um, diversity and inclusion, and um, you know, are are tr trying to trying really hard to um, practice and sustain that. Um, so, um, you know, I work on multiple projects. I think I've, I'm on probably eight different projects, but I am so um, fortunate that. Every um, team that I work with is, is so focused on, um, you know, inclusion and making sure that diverse um, experiences and voices and perspectives are um, are included. So, um, so again, you know, not making any assumptions and listening for the heart with the heart to everyone, um, and that that we are working with and we're working for. Um, and making sure that um, we see everyone as a leader because everyone there's always something that everyone can contribute to um, to to what we're thinking about or working on and um, and and also advocacy um, you know I, I always remember this um, quote from Mahatma Gandhi that um, you need to be the change that you wish to see in the world um, so again um, you know it's it's always easy to talk about things, um, whether it's inclusion or any other topic, but but really being those voices of change and modeling what you want to see happen is really important. Um, as stakeholders, um, we should not be afraid to speak up um, and, and make sure that um, there is action being taken um, that will make a difference. Um, the world is so huge, and I know there are prob many problems and many issues that not one person can um, can fix everything with the wave of magic wand, and um, so so we we can just try to do our parts uh, and be those pebbles in the pond that can cause ripple effects that go in all directions to make a difference. Um, again, making space for new leaders is also very important, um, and making sure that we um, create and sustain a um, meaningful um su sustain a world that is that is meaningful um that has meaningful inclusion of diverse perspectives and voices and experiences abilities um you know that's the only way we can um 
we can make sure that we have done our parts and be ready to pass, a, pass the baton on to um, other peers and or maybe even our next generation, um, you know, for the work to continue on, um, you know, um, again, because it's not one person's um, job and it takes more than a village to um, really make sure that um, that we have a um, space that is more inclusive and diverse. Great, thank you. Toina, your take on this? Um, so for me, um, what kind of comes to mind is two things that I say a lot. <laughs> um, for people who know me, they know I do, um, which is one, teamwork makes the dream work. And um, you make the disease, don't let it make you. Um, those are two things in my family um, that we live by and that I push. Um, and for me, that's because in order to make the dream work, we need everybody to be a part of the team. Um, and this is where for me, um, you know, being a part of the ambassador program um, with Expecting Health is huge. Um, you know, a lot of times, um, when you get into a leadership position or, you know, you become, um, you know, an ambassador or, you know, a manager or anything of that sort, you know, you can lose who you are and you can lose your focus on who everyone else is that helped to make you. Um, and that foundation is something that is huge and that we should never forget. Um, so in the ambassador program, of course, you know, I work with an amazing partner, um, Mariana, um, and really helping to, you know, lead that. However, I'm inspired every single time I interact with any one of those ambassadors. And we come from different spaces, different places, different conditions, different views, and yet we still all come together to make the dream work. Um, and that's huge for me, you know what I mean? Also being able to, you know, when I say, you know, you make the disease, you don't let it make you, that's really a part of, you know, finding yourself. Um, and a lot of times, you know, people are scared to have that voice because they don't know who they are and they don't realize their power. So being able to inspire, you know, everyone um, to be open and just realize that um, to Deba's point, everyone has something to offer. You know, it might not be exactly what you're looking for at that time. Um, and Natasha, I think you even pointed out, you know, somebody said something that three years later became, you know, it's all about planting that seed and being open to, you know, you not being the only one who can plant it. And that in order for, you know, things to really work and for things to really grow um, and for things to really be able to move forward we need everybody, all cultures, all backgrounds, all visions, all voices, like we need everybody to really help the dream work. Great, thank you. And you know, I, I love that saying too, teamwork makes the dream work. So com completely, um, completely agree with that. Um, our next question, um, which Toina will kick off, um, is actually tied to a comment that just came in through um, the chat. So um, I'll ask the question and then I'll, I'll make a reference to the comment in, um, in the chat. But, you know, unconscious or implicit or hidden bias, it's called a couple of different things, can be a roadblock for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, in your roles as uh, family leaders, you know, what unconscious biases have you seen and what impact has that had um, on inclusion and how, how can these biases be addressed? And uh, Twain, I know you, you already kind of referenced that a bit, um, but I think uh, it's great timing that this question is up when we have um, uh, one of our participants, um, Nadia, talking about, um, you know, teaching professionals how to be actively uh, how to actively challenge implicit bias uh, that, you know, they have been and we have been conditioned from childhood um, and is really difficult. That's really difficult work to do um, and and really understanding what that DEI work um, really means now. 
um, and they posted that the OLM DEI initiative developed the unlearning program that has been doing that type of work um, and providing a safe environment for professionals to identify and, and evaluate um, implicit bias that then impact their daily decisions and engagement. So that's great and a great resource for um, anyone involved in that or anyone looking to learn more about that. So thank you so much for sharing that, Nadia. Um, and, but Tawena, you know, kick us off in terms of, we know this is part of the work, right? So if the work were easy, it'd just be easy and we'd just be doing it. But this is the hard part, you know, no, most people don't think they have any biases or anything going on. And when confronted with it, it can be um, shocking um, and that's normal, but how do we make sure that shock, shockingness doesn't, you know, derail efforts? Right, no, and I mean, and that's huge to me um, because, you know, you can say anything, it's all in how you say it, um, you know, and again, you know, how I brought up accountability earlier, you know, accountability is huge, um, you know, if me and you, I'm just going to use you as an example, or walking down the street and I see you do something wrong, it's my job to say something to you because, what you don't know, you can't learn from. If you don't know it's broke, you can't fix it. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, I think that's where we start. You know what I mean? A lot of times, you know, people see things and they're afraid to speak up. You know, they're afraid to call their coworker out or their sibling out or, you know, cause it can happen anywhere. It's not just, you know what I mean? In the healthcare, you know, thing, it, to your point, it starts at childhood. It starts at home. You know what I mean? But again, if they don't know what they're doing is wrong, how can they fix it? So I think, you know, you have to really be intentional um, when you bring those things to light, um, but they have to be brought to light. And I think that's where we are now. Like, We've started to identify some issues and we started to speak on some issues. Now it's time to start taking action um, and really leading by example, to be honest. Um, because for me, you know, if I'm not doing these things and I'm not showing love and I'm not including everybody, and if I'm not, you know, holding myself accountable and being open when someone gives me, you know, constructive criticism because it's real <laughs> um if I'm not open to those things how can I expect someone else to be so I think you know it starts with each of us and then you know once we do that then we continue to do what we're doing now in the programs of the family center and the programs of the ambassador program to have people that are there and available that when people don't understand what to do or they even just need to talk it out with someone or they need a shoulder or they need, you know, a landing space and a safe space to be able to ask those questions that they're afraid to ask and, you know, start to walk in a way that might not be easy because everybody else around them ain't walking like that. You know, that's where we go next. And that's where I feel like it's really important. Great, thank you. Deepa, anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I definitely, um, you know, see unconscious bias playing an active role uh, sometimes, um, you know, in, in, and just, just to give you an example, I, uh, many times I've heard uh, professionals or other um, people coming to me and saying, where can we find a parent leader like you? I'm like, no, you, you don't find someone, you know, they're already there. You just have to make sure you invest time and effort to work with someone to understand what they can do. And, um, you know, um, so, so it's, it's not like I was, I was found this way, you know, I was made this way. Somebody poured into me. I had mentors, I had peers who supported me. So, um, so really, you know, it's making that effort, you know, taking the time and putting in, investing in those, in, in those people that you um, want to see make a difference, you know, is, is really important. Um, and the other piece is, um, uh, you know, I was also working with one of the teams uh, around family engagement, 
and their intentions were really good. They really wanted to engage parents, but because of the early childhood um, nature of the work that they were doing, they were um, hesitant to ask parents to, uh, to, to help in their efforts. They were, um, you know, and so I asked them, what is preventing you from reaching out to parents? And they said that um, they, think, they thought parents would be, would be so busy with their little ones that they would not have the time to contribute um, and then it all it took was to encourage them to just reach out and see what happens. And, and of course, they reached out and they received, um, you know, responses, uh, you know, that they think they weren't going to get. So, um, you know, many parents were impressed regardless, regardless of how young their children were, or, you know, how less time they had. They really want to be involved. They wanted to contribute in some way. So again, trying to make people think out of the box and be flexible uh, and making space for um, new leaders is, uh, has been really helpful in, um, in kind of reducing at least, I should say, if not eliminating unconscious bias. Great, great. And I think that's you know, such great points. Um, especially around the investment piece. I think we hear that often too um, in terms of people saying, oh, that person you had was great. Can we get someone just like that? And it's like, well, it's not about, you know, replicating someone just like that. It's really, well, you know, who, who can you help? Um, who can you invest in? And, and what are the new stories and different stories? And we learn from that. Is the story drastically different than the story you heard five years ago from another family? Um, is what are the good and bad and, and areas for change in that. So I think that is um, such a great, a great point. Um, if you have a question that you would like to ask, um, not through the chat, but just by verbalizing it, please raise your hand. And, um, and the way you do that is there's, a, if you scroll to the bottom, there's a little emoji that says reactions, and I believe in there you can just um, raise your hand. Um, I will see that, and then I will call on you just to keep things orderly. But um, we have a couple other questions that have come through, one of which is, uh, let me scroll up to see it. Uh, you know, one of the hardest things um, can be starting the conversation, right? I think we've talked a lot about, um, you know, unconscious bias and how do we deal with that, but even just starting the conversation. Do you have any, do either of you have any kind of tips or examples of where to start? Um, you know, I, I think sometimes people worry that these conversations are too tough or there's so many opportunities to mess it up. Uh, whatever that looks like to you, however you've, uh, you know, imagined that in your mind. Um, but just seeing if you all have um, any strategies or suggestions for just, you know, starting off these conversations with either with other families or, or with other stakeholders you're working with. Um, so real quick for me, because mine's is short, start at home, start in your circle, start in your family. Um, you'd be surprised how much, um, just sharing your story and sharing your experiences with people that you know and you already have relationships with will help you to build up the courage to share your story outside. Yeah, um, I think keeping um, a strengths-based perspective has always been helpful and uh, not pointing fingers, but trying to um, trying to focus on solutions versus the problem. Um, and also trying to brainstorm together, you know, trying to um, find that common ground uh, has also uh, been helpful to have some difficult conversations or get started with difficult conversations. Great, great. And so with our last maybe 30 seconds, if you both could speak to, um, uh, Deepa, you can go first. If you can just kind of say, you know, speak to, you know, what are some actions or things that we can be thinking about um, going forward um, in terms of moving, uh, moving the ball along in terms of inclusion and, and the work that we could be doing to make sure this isn't just a blip, but, um, you know, something that's really sustainable um, moving forward. Um, yeah, I would say, um, being intentional, again, that's my key word, I guess, for today, um, including and aligning um, 
uh, you know, everything that you do um, to focus on um, diversity and inclusion, having a plan, have a have a DEI plan, just like an IEP for a child or a or an ind uh, individual health plan for a child. Make sure you you know you have a plan that charts out what resources you need um, to to implement your plan. Um, you know whether it's building relationships with um, with partners from community organizations or family organizations, or whether it's a matter of um, you know, uh, thinking about what, what you may need to implement your activities, whether it's funding that you need to include as part of a grant proposal, whatever it takes, you know, just, just um, be thinking along those lines and be intentional um, in everything that you do. And I think um, it's easier said than done, but, um, but having some type of a reminder um, for us, uh, you know, in our everyday work, um, you know, whether it's whether it's a particular experience, whether or it's an example, um, whether it's a person that that's going to motivate you, whatever it is, you know, just um, having, um, you know, having that in the in our minds every day, in our everyday work uh, could be helpful. Great. Thank you. And Tawana, last words. So my thing would be um, just to be passionate driven and open in all that you do um, and just realize that you're not alone in this journey and there's always people out there who's willing and open um, to connect with you it's just a matter of tapping into it that's Great. good for me <laughs> Thank you so much to both of our panelists, to Deepa and uh, Toina. This was great um, and such a good session. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this was recorded and in the next few weeks, you will get an email saying that this is live. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to anyone who is listed here. Um, and if you don't have time to jot down these uh, email addresses, you can always just reach out to us and we'll connect you to who you want to be connected to. So thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.